Okay. Good morning, afternoon, and evening to all of you joining us from around the world. I'm Monica Louie, and I, would want, I want to welcome you to our first webinar related to WASH and healthcare facilities. This is our second showing as we do our best to accommodate all the time zones. Our focus today is current approaches to menstrual health. We're delighted to be hosting this webinar in collaboration with the Menstrual Health and Hygiene Rotary Action Group. Just a few housekeeping reminders. Please mute yourselves. We are offering simultaneous translation in Spanish, Portuguese, and French today. So you can go to the globe on your screen and select the language you would like to hear. You can continue to put your name, district, and leadership position in the chat. And if you have any questions, please use the Q&A window. We will do our best to answer all of them, either during the webinar or individually. We have a full program, so we won't be spending time introducing all of our speakers and panelists, but please refer to their bios in the electronic program that you have received with your registration reminder. Finally, this webinar will be recorded. All the PowerPoint presentations and the recording will be on the WASH website in a few weeks. We will put the WASH website information in the chat box. I want to thank our sponsors for their continued financial support. They've been with us as we've moved to virtual summits and webinars. Thank you to Procter Gamble, Children's Safe Drinking Water Initiative, UNICEF USA, and Handwash. Thank you again. The World Water Summit and the follow-up webinars would not be possible without the dedication of Rotary WASH volunteers. This group has been meeting regularly since January to plan these events. So a big thank you to Ron Denham, Nancy Gilbert, Brian Hall, Linda Hammond, Patricia Mary Weather Argus, Carolyn Mube, Wade Nomira, Lisa Talley, Neil Van Dyne, and last but not least, Julia Phelps, who has done a fabulous job leading the committee. Finally, please stay with us until the very end. We have a special message from President Shagar about supporting girls that you will want to hear. I will now turn it over to Pat Argus Merriweather, who will moderate the webinar. It's all yours, Pat. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And um, good morning. I'm now going to start with the presentation. And just give me a second. And I just want to say uh, that when we're talking about WASH and, and focusing on WASH and healthcare facilities, that you're going to find that there's really a convergence of not only the World Health Organization, the WHO goals, but also the areas of focus of Rotary. So with that, when we talk about uh, the sustainable development goals, and as you know, this is the World Health Organization focus uh, for 20, to get to us to 2030 to accomplish these very ambitious goals. But one of the things that I have found that has been so um, interesting is the goals all overlap. Um, there's something in there for everyone. And when I'm taking the clean water and sanitation, that's the SDG, the Sustainable Development Goal 6 of clean water and sanitation, you look at it and it affects so many other goals as well. And I think it really affects all the goals, you know, whether we're talking about water for and sanitation for good health and well being. A gender equality that we'll be talking about later today, and also responsible consumption and production. That's something that, again, I think is going to be eye opening to everyone on this call. And we all know that, um, of course, clean water and sanitation are linked to the sanitation issues with polio. So, is Rotary's major program, uh, we have a key role to play as well with water and also uh, polio. And as we see in many countries uh, across, and even in the US, uh, across the world, that water can be uh, uh, an impetus for war or social uh, uh, conflict. And so just like oil has been, water is in many areas. So with that, you know, we talk about the sustainable development goals, but then the World Health Organization went ahead and said, you know, we really need some focus areas under the SDGs. And so one of the areas that they focused on in 2019, which will go to 2030, is having WASH in all healthcare facilities. 
And why? Uh, because it will reduce maternal and newborn deaths. It stops the spread of infections. And as we'll see, it has a huge impact on the health and well being of everyone, but it also does on communities as well. And just I, on Wednesday of this week, uh, they launched the Global Patient Safety Plan for 2021 to 2030. This was approved in May of 2021 by the World Health Assembly, and it really focuses on reducing adverse events. Adverse events are preventable conditions that occur that result in harm to a patient or death. And so they group things like WASH, having WASH uh, within healthcare facilities, antimicrobial stewardship, vaccines. And when you think about it, and this is uh, some hard numbers to take, is 810 women die just about every day from preventable causes related to pregnancy and childbirth. And then when you look at another number, which is even more startling, is 6,700 newborns die each day due to lack of quality of care at birth, but also one of the leading causes of death for women at birth, giving birth, as well as newborns, are infections due to unclean water. So again, this really makes the case for we're all in this together to work together to uh, prevent harm and also reduce deaths. So when we talk about water and sanitation wash, it's really about the lives saved and enhanced. Now, in terms of what this means uh, in, uh, with wash and healthcare facilities, I just think about this, 45% of healthcare facilities lack basic water service. So you're going in for healthcare and you sometimes come out with an infection. Uh, these are preventable if we have clean water and we practice basic hygiene. And when you look at how many people this affects, over 900 million have no water service at healthcare facilities and 1.5 billion have no sanitation at their healthcare facilities. Again, it's no wonder that we have so many infections and so many deaths caused by infections. Now, what we're gonna, we talked about how this really affects so many different areas, WASH, but there's another one that we're gonna talk about today, which is related to WASH, but also it relates to other areas of focus too, and that's menstrual health and hygiene. You're going to see that it affects education, the environment, community economic development, and certainly ties into WASH. Uh, when you think about the resources we devote to these initiatives, you're going to find that we can achieve multiple goals. And I think with the menstrual health and hygiene today, you're going to hear about some wonderful achievements uh, that can be reached if we, again, leverage our resources and understand, uh, have a basic understanding of the needs of menstrual health and hygiene. And with that, I'm now going to turn the program over to Sharmila. Sharmila is the uh, she's the chair of the recently approved Rotary Action Group on Menstrual Health and Hygiene, and she is a force within the um, menstrual health and hygiene. So glad to have you today, Sharmila. It's all yours. Thank you very much, Pat. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Let me just pull up my presentation. Um, this is our website, www.ragmhh.org. And if you have any questions or you want to ask us anything, do drop us an email on ragmhh at gmail.com. What do we do as an RAG, our goals and missions to enhance the dignity to women and girls, enable them to live a self-determined life, access to education, economic self-maintenance, reduce menstrual waste, and contribute to the environmental protection. We cover the seven areas of focus, peace and conflict resolution. Women have no possibility to learn a profession and earn their own money. 
Consequently, to survive, they are forced to get married a very young age and are bound in forced and often violent marriages. Basic education and literacy, girls cannot attend school. They lose connections in means of education and finally give up schooling completely. Disease prevention, treatment, maternal and child health. During their marriage, they bear many children because they do not have any access to birth control either. On one side, children are mean of security for the future. On another, many pregnancies in areas of low medical care are a risk for life for these women. Women do not have access to clean water and hygienic products to run a sick run significant higher risk of suffering diseases and infection due to their menstruation, economic and community development. Women who do not work means a lack of gross income to the country. For example, I've taken India. If enrolled 1% more girls in school, their GDP would raise by $5.5 million billion. Water and sanitation to enable girls and women to continue their lives normally and in dignity during their menstruation and create opportunities for future independence and safety. The access to laboratories and other water supplies and menstrual hygiene products are essential. And environmental protection, girls, women use menstrual cup or biodegradable sanitary napkins, pads, save tons of waste, which means a significant impact on the environment. Over the course of a woman's roughly 38 years of menstruation, she only had to throw away four small menstrual cups instead of 8,000 to 17,000 tampons. That's a difference of almost 300 pounds of waste. In the US alone, approximately 12 billion pads and 7 billion tampons are discarded each year. These numbers are startling, especially when it's juxtaposed with a minimal impact of alternative female hygiene products that are available. It is clear that reusable menstrual cup and reusable pads and period underwears are more environmentally friendly than the traditional hygiene products. Just how use wasteful are tampons and pads and why do people still use disposable products if sustainable, cheaper options exist? Let's revisit the environmental impact of tampons and pads. In the US alone, approximately 12 billion pads and 7 billion tampons are discarded each year. While many of these products end up in landfill, other clogs, sewages, and contribute to staggering amount of plastic in our ocean, tampon applicators take around 20 years to break down in marine environments and can be digested by animals, causing health complications or even death. One in four teens have missed class because of lack of access to period products. And these are examples of the products that are available. We have the pretty looking menstrual cups that comes in little pretty looking pouches. And we've got sanitary napkins which comes in various designs. And we idea is to encourage your circle of friends to use menstrual cup, talk to them about it, Give it to them as part of a birthday gift. Speak to your colleagues at work. And lastly, spread the word and break the silence. Thank you very much. And thank you, Sharmila. I, again, I think this really gives you a preview of what we're going to have um, discussions about in great detail as we move on. And our next speaker is Dr. Maniksha Bharat, um, who's going to be talking about the current approaches, the advantages and disadvantage with cups, pads, and tampons. Doctor. Okay. We can't hear you right now. You haven't given me the share screen. Could you please give me the share screen? Uh, you should be able to share your screen. It's turned on for all presenters. There you go. Tanika, quickly. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Pat, for the wonderful introduction. I'm going to talk about happy periods. That's an oxymoron. And would you ever consider your periods and my periods as happy? It never was. But when you go sustainable, 
there is a fabulous chance that your periods will be happy. And that's what I'm looking forward to the generation that is menstruating now to have happy periods. Each one of us realized that two months in a year we are menstruating and that's a long duration, 2,500 days in our lifetime. The evolution of the pad has happened over the last 50 years and as it has evolved, it has become more and more plastic. 95% of the contents of the pad are all plastic. The reality of our menstrual hygiene products, we thought it was convenient, it was thin, leak proof and hygienic because it was bleached and white, but in actual reality, because it's made of plastics and chemicals, it causes infections and rashes associated with health problems, makes the menstrual blood stink, non-biodegradable, not reusable, not recyclable, and of course clogs the drains and bloats in water. The impact on the health is enormous, and because the vagina is such an absorbable area, like our you know, buccal mucosa, the pad stays so close to the uh, vagina that it tends to absorb everything that is there in the pad. In the pad. So cloth, uh, the disposable sanitary pads are made of styrene, chloromethane, acetone, and styrofoam. And there are bleaches that are dioxins and furans to make it look virgin white, pesticide re residues, unknown fragrances and adhesives. And it creates a lot of problems from allergic rash to environmental endocrine disruption to reproductive harm and in the long term, maybe even cancer. Effects of the disposable pads and tampons are many from the most obvious, which is chafing of the thighs and the genitals to cystitis, to white discharge per vagina, to contact dermatitis, to malodor, leaks from the tampons, uh, dryness of the vaginal mucosa because the tampon has no sensor in it, which says just absorb blood, uh, dryness of the vaginal mucosa, vaginal infections, and occasionally toxic shock syndrome. If we look at the comparative health analysis, Obviously, the disposable sanitary products have been producing a lot of problems for all of us because the cup is intravaginal. Therefore, it doesn't produce any of the rashes and irritation of the thigh. It doesn't produce cystitis. It doesn't produce, um, because it's made of medical grade silicon, it doesn't produce toxic shock syndrome, much less than the tampons. The impact on the economics is enormous. As you can see here, the cups cost in Indian rupees, a cup will last you 10 years. In Indian rupees, it will cost you 900 to 1000 rupees. The cloth pads, which have come out in a new avatar, will cost 1600 rupees over a 10 year period, while the disposables will cost us 10,000 rupees. That is enormous money that goes down the drain every single time. Period poverty is the sad state where a woman does not have money to buy what is supposedly hygienic. Over the last 50 years, we have been brainwashed into thinking that the only hygienic way of dealing with our periods is to use single-use disposable sanitary pads. Why? Because it's a huge industry that can afford huge advertisements in the television uh, and you know have the best stars locally to talk about how good the disposable sanitary napkin is. Unfortunately, this is not the same with the reusable products because it has very small margins and therefore we will not be able to advertise it the same way as the disposable sanitary napkins. So, Period poverty is because we can't buy single-use disposables. But if we get to use reusable products like the cup and the reusable cloth pad, then we will be able to solve the period poverty problem as immediately as tomorrow morning. 
So if we have to eradicate period poverty, governments across the country are trying to do this by providing free menstrual hygiene products to girls and women, which are all single use disposables. Scotland gave, gave free menstrual products at the cost of 13 pounds per month. Every month for over 10 years, if they give, they're going to spend 8.7 billion uh, GBP uh, for this. But if the 13 pounds are spent to give a menstrual cup to each woman, they will save enormous amounts of money because that cup will last 10 years. So can we, can the world make a difference by shifting to sustainable, reusable menstrual hygiene products? I'm sure you'll agree that basically cost effectiveness and the environmental impact and the comfort for the women using the reusable products will change the whole atmosphere. So the impact on the environment is totally amazing. Uh, Sharmila already told us how much of waste is being produced across the world. When burnt, these will produce dioxins and furans, which are just not good for everybody's health. So if we look at it, landfills affect where the pads all land up at landfills. It affects our water, soil, and air. So we need to understand that single-use disposables produce environmental harm across the board. Incineration is considered as the right way to dispose of the single-use uh, pads and uh, tampons. WHO recommends that the temperatures be more than 800 degrees for proper incineration. But the existing micro incinerators operate at 300 to 400 degrees and is supplied to the developing countries. At this temperature, dioxins and furans, which are transparent ga gases, are generated and released into the air and therefore are enormous environmental pollutants. So disposable by incineration is a no-no. If you look at the disposal analysis, every single pad use needs to be disposed by, while the cloth pads are, can be used for two to three years and one cup can be used for seven to 10 years. The water analysis is important. Cloth pads use two mugs per cloth pad per wash and the menstrual cup uses half a mug of water for every insertion. So, Water economics is also enormous with these. So sustainable solutions are two. One is old and one is new. The old one is the cloth pad, which has come out in a new avatar, which is for the young menstruating girls up to the age of 18 or 20 or by the time they get married. And once they are married or they are adult and they can make an adult choice, they can use a menstrual cup for every 10 years, which means three menstrual cups in their lifetime. So solution one is the cloth pads. Solution two is the menstrual cup, which are over a hundred varieties that are available in the world. So the menstrual cup is something which is two inches tall and all it does is collects the blood, unlike the disposable sanitary napkin, or the cloth pad, which absorbs the blood. You then pull it out, drop the blood, wash it and put it back again into the vagina and it forms a beautiful seal. And it is one of the best things that women can use because they don't even feel that they are getting their periods. Cleaning is very simple. Just wash it with plain water, no soap, nothing because the vagina is an unsterile organ and can be um, you know, doesn't need any sterility. Of course, because this cup is so comfortable, don't forget to remove it once in, uh, you know, 12 hours. All right. You can swim, hike, jump, sleep in any position while using the cup. It is, you can really um, do every activity that you want. It's important to have peer review because then the peers will tell you that use it and that is the way to spread. 
we can't afford any advertisements for the sustainable products. If you look at the comparison of the blood holding capacity, normally a period will have 50 to 80 ml of blood, but pad, can, pad tampon and reusable cloth pad can absorb only 5 ml. But the menstrual cup has three times the capacity and therefore the changes are less frequent and therefore more comfortable to the woman. The way forward, what is the way forward for us? The way forward is sustainability in every form and for menstruation, the way forward is sustainability too. With the WASH program, bring about a behavioral change in the girls and ladies towards menstruation. Rotarians, inner wheel members and rotractors can all be part of this. And Rotarians who are fortunate or Rotarian wives who are fortunate to be uh, you know, menstruating can use this, understand it, and then spread the word. The same with the inner wheel members and the rotractors. So don't give up the chance of using this wonderful uh, solution for your period hygiene. Talk to the boys and men and normalize conversations about the period so that the shame of the period is removed. Provide, uh, you know, people below the poverty line or those who can't afford to buy this reusable washable cloth pads and menstrual cup because the two disadvantages of the men menstrual cup is one is an upfront payment and two the uh, requirement for the learning curve. So Rotary should stop investing in single use sanitary pads, pad dispensing machines and incinerators. If you look at this, this is the 10 year quantities of what a single woman would use, 1800 disposable sanitary napkins versus 20 cloth pads versus one menstrual cup. It doesn't require any mathematical genius to choose which is the right way to go. So using reusable menstrual hygiene products gives total independence to the woman from the period problems, reduces 95% of the expenditure on the menstrual care products, 95% of the sanitary waste, and 100% more comfortable. It's a no rash, no cash, no trash program. So let's, under the aegis of Rotary, like they eradicated polio nearly, let's look at eradicating period poverty. Both of them start with a P. Let's eradicate period poverty from this earth. And that's what I'm looking forward to. And all of us in the RAG MHH is looking forward to giving every woman, every child a comfortable period. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to explain this to all of you. Thank you, Dr. Manisha. And we do have a, a few questions. Excellent presentation. Carolyn, do you wanna ask the questions that are in the chat box? Sure. Or the um, yeah. And just a reminder for those who have questions, please put them in the question and, air, and answer section, not chat, because I don't always monitor chat. Um, yes, a question is, and it was similar to one we had last night, why are the under 18 year old women recommended to use a cloth pad rather than a cup? So it is traditionally accepted. I said, if they're sexually active, they can start using this earlier. But traditionally, in all the um, you know, Indian subcontinent areas and in the African areas, people are very worried about using the cup and therefore breaking the hymen or making it looser, which is why we say, and of course, the young girl doesn't know her body as well as the older woman would. Therefore, cloth pads are what is recommended for them because it is very similar to the disposable sanitary napkin. It is easy to wash and easy to use, and it has wings exactly like the disposable sanitary napkins. So which is the reason why we don't recommend it. And the mother uses it. The mother can actually recommend it to her daughter earlier than the 18 years. But once they are 18, 
they are adults and they can make an adult choice. Thank you. Um, another question that Ursula had, has written is cups are great. However, clean water needs to be accessible for the cup um, to be cleaned. The cup must have to be washed. So does a woman's hands have to wash a woman's hands before and, and after emptying it? Um, can you talk about the cleaning of it and the need of clean water, how to clean the cup? if you don't have a lot access to safe water? So I don't understand the safe water. Everybody has water to drink, to cook, to wash, to have a bath. If these are all available, the same water is more than adequate to wash the menstrual cup. And the quantity of water that is used to wash the menstrual cup is just half a glass, 200 or 250 ml is all that is necessary. And like I said, the vagina is an unsterile organ and the vagina is full of different bacteria that are healthy for the vagina. So this menstrual cup does not allow any infection to stick to it because it's of medical grade silicon and inserting it inside will not create any infection. So I hope I have answered your question that the water requirement is very little and that to wash it, any water that you would normally use under the circumstances for bath, for drinking, for cooking is adequate to clean it. And there is no need for any soap. Also remember that when we have intercourse, we don't clean our partners with any um, cleansing agent before we have intercourse. more question that just came in and it's um, how do you manage the cup use with virginity concept in India? Therefore, I told you, we don't recommend it for younger than 18 year olds. Of course, if they get married before that, then there is, none, there is no concept of virginity there. So that is all right. So the low hanging fruit is anybody who is married can use the menstrual cup. The only time you can't use the menstrual cup is post delivery because your vagina would have expanded to allow the head of the baby to come out. Okay, well, this has been a real education for all of us. Um, and I so appreciate you going into great detail so that we can really understand and appreciate uh, the value of cups and also the, the um, reusable pads as well. Thank you, doctor. And, and now we're gonna turn over to um, Charlie Ruth Castro, who's going to be discussing uh, the Rotary grants that are being done and the global grants that can be done for this initiative. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And it's a double honor to, to speak after Dr. Menashe, who is a real health expert and, and global health expert. Uh, today, I am going to share um, some of the ideas that someone like me, uh, who is only uh, an innovator and a lawyer who loves to solve problems can do for, for attending these challenges on uh, menstrual poverty. Uh, the reality is that I learned uh, that this, was, this is a big issue working with women in prisons. I had to went to, to, to a prison to understand the, the measure and the deep impact uh, for life in, 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 in this ambience for women. And uh, the lack of access to menstrual products, um, it's due to poverty, misinformation, taboo, cultural barriers, uh, but especially the lack of vision to find better solutions. Menstrual um, cycles have been with us since we are human beings. Uh, but this is, this is the recent story of uh, innovation applied to women's health, what can save the, the equation. Uh, 1.9 billion of women today have problems to access to adequate menstrual products. And it's our responsibility as uh, Rotarians and leaders to find solutions. And what is 1.9 billion of women? 
um, imagine that you gather all the entire population of China, United States and Brazil together. So this is huge. And this is a right moment when to solve this big problem. Um, menstruation is expensive. And, and like I said last night, every single woman uh, in this planet should be proud to menstruate. I, I am proud to say that uh, uh, 18 years ago, I started to menstruate and it's part of our conversation today to break the chain and, and to humanize and make more natural this conversation. But yes, menstruation is expensive because in 38 years, you must invest between uh, 1,500 to 2,000 uh, um, dollars for having an entire supply of uh, menstrual pads or tampons. This is the most common reality for many women, but the problem is that many women around the globe don't have $2,000 for uh, paying their, themselves a uh, uh, life supply of menstrual products. And like Dr. Dr. Menashe has mentioned, there are better and more sustainable solutions. Uh, yes, one is uh, cloth pads, but my favorite, and I have to be very clear here, my favorite and the most sustainable and the most efficient and the most economic in my own sense and, and, and from the experience that I have worked um, uh, in three countries in Latin America is menstrual cup. Please break the fear to menstrual cup. Uh, menstrual cups are safe, are economic, are super easy to use, and, you know, they gave us the freedom to be ourselves. With only one menstrual cup, you can have uh, all that you need uh, to manage your, your menstrual needs between seven and 10 years. It's leak free up to 12 hours, it's sanitary, it's reusable, it's very, very, very cheap, and it's eco friendly. And, you know, since last year when I joined the Rorty Action Group for Menstrual Health and Hygiene, I proposed a big uh, milestone. We can deliver 20,000 menstrual cups covering all the educational and research um, uh, resources, uh, creating this global grant of $400,000. What will be the impact of creating such a, a big project? Well, in the sense of health, we can increase the confidence uh, of thousands of women and girls participating in this project. We can create a zero waste mindset using these cups because together, together with 20,000 uh, women, we can save almost 2,000 uh, tons of trash and this means more than 1 million kilograms of uh, CO2. And saving money, this is one of my favorite parts of this type of projects, because for each dollar that a woman saves, she can invest it in her education or in improving the life uh, for herself and for her uh, family or circle. But when we are talking that we can deliver 20,000 menstrual cup, we are talking that this represents savings for almost $8 million. And if you, uh, like me, are interested in, in business uh, measures, this is a return over investment from 1 to 20. So it's a good business for everyone, too. And I have had the experience of delivering almost 3,000 menstrual cups in the last two years in prisons in Colombia, Mexico, and with Latino communities in the United States. I am super proud to invite Rotarians, men and women, and my friends who are a real experts in health, uh, like Dr. Piedad and uh, other global experts who helped me to enrich the conversation and to amplify the confidence for women and girls to talk about menstruations and break the chain. Um, if you're interested to talk more about this, please uh, call me or add me uh, on your LinkedIn. We can mark an impactful milestone in global women's health. I am convinced of this. And uh, the, the good news is that the uh, Rotary Club from Mexico City jump into this project. I know that my dear friend Ines Murua uh, in Argentina is also pushing uh, this milestone too. And this is your turn. Please call me or add me to LinkedIn and let's talk more. Thank you so much. 
Oh, that is great. Um, and thank you for such an initiative for taking such a leadership role, you and Inez. Um, again, what a, an amazing uh, initiative. And I know that, um, at Carolyn, are there any questions? We can't hear you. Sorry about that. I was monitoring questions. Um, I think we're, I think there was a question about menstrual cups affecting the size. Does it enlarge um, the vagina? Are there any health issues that go along with it? Uh, yes. Well, Dr. Minashi uh, partly replied, but in my opinion, and, the, and this is opinion from the doctors that I work for, you don't break the hymen uh, because you introduce a cup. You break the hymen when you have a first um, uh, sexual relationship uh, due to the movement of uh, both um, reproductive systems, the men and the women. Uh, so this is, this is part of breaking the taboos. You, you are not going to break your hymen because you are using a menstrual cup or even if you masturbate yourself. Uh, what breaks the hymen, that is a very, very strong uh, tissue in our bodies, is the movement, is the shaking, repetitive shaking. So we have to open our minds. And, and I know that I belong to a different culture from India and some uh, uh, African cultures where uh, virginity is something very important that define the role of a woman in a society. In America, where we are kind of more relaxed in this conversation but you know we have to separate this issue from uh something more important that is women's health uh women's health is more important than the definition societal definition of what we can do if we are virgin or not and let me tell you what my doctor says you are not going to break your hymen because you are using a menstrual cup okay dr manisha uh so the Vagina doesn't expand by putting a men menstrual cup inside. I told you when we deliver, the vagina expands to allow a 10 centimeter diameter head. And then the vagina then by six weeks to eight weeks comes back to the normal size. So the cup remaining there for the duration of four to five days will not expand the vagina under any circumstances. And the hymen, is a very small tissue, a big issue about a little tissue. And the hymen already has a hole in it, which can only expand a little bit like a rubber band if you will insert the cup inside or if you will have intercourse. So because young girls who are not sexually active still bleed, that means there is a hole in the hymen already present, normal. So it's not an imperforate hymen. The imperforate hymen is a very small percentage. So therefore, I think the worry about the cup expanding the vagina is not, um, doesn't hold water. And the other thing that men ask is, will my pleasure be reduced if I use, a, if my wife uses a menstrual cup because the vagina will expand again. The pleasure of the, um, intercourse is at the introitus. It's not inside. The reason I answer these with a straight face is because I am a gynecologist and I've been answering this all my life. Thank you, doctor. And thank you, Charlie, uh, for, for such a, a, a frank and open discussion, because that's what really provides the understanding and the education is, is having that open discussion. I'm now going to turn over to Smita Kulkarni, who's going to be talking about a Green Dot program, and this is Women Micro Enterprise on uh, menstrual pads. Smita? Thank you, Pat. Greetings, everyone. Namaste. Uh, I'm Smita from Bangalore. And uh, just a while ago, Dr. Minakshi, as well as uh, Charlie mentioned, 
how we can save money if we move to uh, sustainable alternatives. And I'm going to go on the other side and talk about how we can make money using it. So this is a green dot program. And the reason we call it green dot is because we want multiple green livelihood centers across the country, across the world, um, which will give livelihood to women as well as spread the word on sustainable menstrual practices. So we've all heard about, you know, uh, the, there are many designs of cloth pads available and uh, I, I'm, I'm waiting for the day when we'll have designer pads, you know, instead of, in addition to designing uh, clothing, uh, designers will now start designing fashionable cloth pads. So there are many, you know, whether it's foldable pads, jacket insert model, or the small size, large size, extra large, there are many different uh, designs in pads itself, uh, as well as the menstrual cups. So what we uh, uh, have been doing uh, for the past few years is trying to get more and more women uh, engaged, not only into producing them, uh, but also spreading awareness on creating a market for these. So if we just look at few designs of cloth pads, they're fairly simple if they have access to the material uh, and they know a basics of tailoring, any woman will be able to stitch. In fact, you know, it will be great if uh, girls are taught that in the regular craft, craft class in schools. Um, the, the trick is not in actually get stitching a perfect cloth pad. It's more so in selling it, creating a market for it. So every green dot center is basically an NGO, which has about 10 producers who are producing these cloth pads and 20 crusaders. It's like their sales team who's actually going out and more than selling a product, they're selling the concept of sustainable menstrual practice. Why do they need to change? Right now, everyone is using some form of, you know, whether it's a, a disposable pad or tampons, whatever they're using, they have an inertia to move from it unless they have enough awareness on what are the problems in, in the current solutions and why move, uh, why change? So this is, this is what, you know, we, we, we gave the name uh, Crusader to the person who's actually, you know, it's not a sales team, it's actually a Crusader who's actually going out and talking about uh, menstruation in the first place and then menstrual practices and then sustainable menstrual practices. So like I was saying, 2X plus X. So if there is, there are five producers, 10 Crusaders. If there are 10 producers, then 20 Crusaders. We've seen that this is the ratio that really works. We have, we've experimented with having only producers or only crusaders uh, or different uh, organization doing the producing and different organization doing the crusading. But we've seen the most, the best thing that works is actually a single organization having the entire team with them. They don't try to undercut each other. So a typical training program would have, you know, uh, these are the broad responsibilities where, you know, Rotary can be the anchor organization, the funding organization, as well as the facilitating organization between um, both the train trainers and the trainees. Uh, Stone Soup is, is, is the training organization. They have the, you know, we have the knowledge of the materials, what kind of uh, uh, designs are more popular than the others and any mentoring support required for a year long program. You know, uh, it is not a one-time training wherein uh, some training is given and then it uh, depends on each person how they practice it. But a lot of times often, especially for the crusaders, there are a lot of things that come when they actually hit the field. So a lot of people asking different kinds of questions on, you know, if I have a UTI, can I still use a menstrual cup? And we saw a few questions coming here. But when they actually go out, different people have different concerns. You know, if you say that there is so much plastic in the pads, how come this also has plastic? And how come, you know, this, uh, is there any research on, is, it, is this harmful? You know, will this like expand the vagina or any other, you know, a lot of questions come up during uh, an, an actual discussion with people. So a year long mentoring uh, in terms of regular interaction and uh, helping them gain the knowledge, become the experts in, the, in, their, in this field. And of course, the trainee uh, organization who identifies, you know, if, if a person has the affinity and attention to detail, probably they would make good producer. If they are fairly good in their communication skills, they would probably make a better uh, crusader and building up that team. And of course, managing and having the, you know, uh, progress and uh, basically doing the coordination between everyone. 
A typical producer training uh, earlier we used to conduct in person, but we've realized in the last one year, we've conducted about four trainings online uh, on Zoom and uh, it's, it's gone out really surprisingly well. So the basic infrastructure of the sewing machine and how to operate is not covered at this. We're assuming that they have that knowledge. They are already stitching some bags, mask, or some basic skills are already there. Um, what is provided is, is, is the additional infrastructure in terms of button machines or something very specific to cloth pads, the material itself to produce fair number of uh, pads and the different stencils for different designs. You know, there are different uh, size required for the outer layer, for the inner layers, number of layers and other things. And of course, uh, the, the batch is uh, reviewed and quality feedback is given and re-reviewed based on the need. The Crusader training typically consists of what Dr. Minakshi uh, conveyed today in terms of why, why it make the shift. Um, and what is, you know, uh, based on research, what is the, uh, what, is, what are the different chemicals which are there, why do you shift and things like that. Also a basic sales training, uh, because a lot of times, you know, I mean, all of you have come to the webinar with the intention to learn, uh, but most often these ladies will be going out in the field where women will not be interested to know more or will not be interested to be, to be challenged I know their life choices being challenged by them saying that you are using pad, they are so harmful, you are doing, you're dumping the earth with all the garbage and you know, they'll go on the defensive. So basic uh, sales training on how do you do cold calling? How do you introduce the concept in such a way that there is an impact and uh, there is a call to action. A lot of practice pitches and on-field support as well. And of course, have, you know, equipping them with necessary uh, information, uh, flip charts, posters, uh, uterus model, and how to use, and basic FAQs. The economics of it, so typically the profits um, uh, from the uh, sales will be divided into three parts. Uh, one third of it goes to the producer, one third of it goes to the crusader, and one third of it goes to the organization who's managing both the producers and crusaders since you know it is uh, incentive based there is incentive there is uh, you know uh, that added uh, appetite to um, the uh, impetus to actually uh, sell more and um, not only the the uh, what you call product but also the concept and slowly they will see their conversion rate improving. And I've just given some uh, figures here, but I, I, you know, if anybody is interested, I'll be happy to send a detailed uh, analysis of what are these figures and how much uh, can each earn and how many, what is the typical combination of producers and crusaders. So these calculations are assuming there are 10 producers and 20 crusaders. So typically an, an organization can expect to earn uh, about 2000 US dollars uh, per month, which is uh, quite a bit in, in, in terms of Indian currency. And the training cost itself uh, is uh, this is uh, this is the amount for uh, uh, one whole year of uh, support as well as the training as well as the materials used and other things. I would be happy to run you through the actual figures you know, if anyone is, is interested. There are a lot of units which are functioning now in different part of parts of India. And uh, like I said, the, the bottom three of them have uh, been enabled by online training. And we just, we just uh, you know, this is one of the golden, uh, uh, what do you call the silver linings of the pandemic where we are able to reach more and more people and enable them uh, right from you know, wherever we are. So these are my contact details. I'll also uh, type it in the chat. If there are, anybody's interested, happy to explain more. Thank you for the opportunity and looking forward to many green dots across the world. <laughs> Thank you, Smita. And this was a- I'm carrying one green dot on my head right now. <laughs> <laughs> it is a very interesting uh, presentation because again, we've gone through, we've talked about the, the health, um, the education, as well as now and, and the opportunity to reduce the uh, impact on the environment, as well as uh, an opportunity, an economic opportunity uh, for women uh, to make these pads and also to spread uh, the opportunity to use the pads. I'm now gonna turn it over to Anu Kendry and Anu is going to 
address the issue of wash in schools, and especially with a focus on um, the menstrual health and hygiene. And I do want to say this addresses a question that was in the chat, or the Q and A, uh, about what can be done in terms of bringing wash and sanitary conditions in schools to people in low income areas. So Anu, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Thanks for the opportunity. And <clears throat> yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to present a different aspect of menstrual hygiene, which is the value of girls' toilets and privacy, which is as important for menstrual hygiene as many other things. So um, when I was preparing this presentation, there was a very disturbing article which I read in one of the Indian newspapers a few days back, which spoke about how teachers who are teaching in rural schools in a state of India called Uttar Pradesh have asked for three days of menstrual leave every month because the toilets that they have in the schools are unusable. It's absolutely shocking that, you know, uh, to hear something like this. And the reality is today, the data tells us that about a quarter of girls are still dropping out of school once they, once they reach poverty. And the, one of the main reasons for that is the lack of proper toilets. Of course, there are other reasons, you know, like the taboos that are there in certain cultures and all. But one of the main reasons is that they just don't have proper toilets in their schools. India, as well as other countries, the UN, everyone is on this drive to create toilets in schools. And yes, there has been a lot of progress, but sometimes while all these toilets do exist on paper, in reality, when you go and see the situation, it's very different. And that's what I'm just going to give you an example of that. And then we can see what is that we can take away from this in terms of menstrual hygiene. So we are very closely in touch with a senior school for girls in, uh, the, in the city that we operate in. Uh, in India, the, in the part of India that I'm in, the senior schools are called junior colleges. That's why you see this picture. It's called the Government Junior College for Girls. We have been in touch. Our club has been in touch with the school for a long time. We provided benches and other infrastructure. And the principal was constantly in touch with some of our members. So he called us and he said, you know what, we have a problem. You need to come and see. So this school is about 70 years old. It's located right in the center of the city. And it gives free education to girls, uh, senior school girls. And uh, it has about, uh, it had about a thousand girls at that time in the age group of 16 to 19. And when we spoke to the girls, when we spoke to the teachers, when we spoke to the principal, what we heard was that the girls said, we are just very reluctant to go to school because of the lack of toilets, lack of proper toilets. The toilets are dirty, they're unusable. So uh, we don't want to go to school, especially during periods. And, you know, sometimes we go back home for lunch and we just don't come back. They, some of them said we are even scared to drink water because we might have to go to the toilet. And, uh, you know, every time we need to go to the toilet or, you know, if one of us needs some sanitary napkins or some help like that, we have to go to the principal's room and she helps us out. And they have no place to wash hands at all in that whole school. They also spoke about drinking water problems and other general infrastructure problems. So after all this discussion, when we actually did an analysis to see what was the situation, it was quite horrifying. They had only two functioning toilets in that whole school for 1,000 girls. And these were actually attached to the principal's room. They had a whole toilet block, which had about, you know, about 20 toilets that was dilapidated and unusable, and it had no water. There was a new toilet block they had that was built by a private organization but that whole block was not functioning because it was not connected to the drainage. They just made the toilets and they left. And they had zero hand wash stations. They did not even have drinking water. There was, there was a drinking water plant, but it was not functional. And there were no dispensers anywhere in the school. They had other problems like electrical fixtures and computer labs and all, but that's not relevant to what we are discussing today. We were also not able to get any help from the government or the municipality on this for the school because you know, they just cite a lack of funds. So what did we do there? Uh, we actually built 23 toilets in that school. We also built an overhead water storage tank, which is a necessary part of the infrastructure if you're building toilets, because where is the water going to come from? The school had some two bore wells and there was also some municipal water supply. So we made sure that the water supply was adequate. We set up 10 hand wash stations. Each one of them had three basins. So we set up 10, sta 10 stations all over the school. We um, 
put a sanitary napkins dispensing machine which dr minakshi will be very angry about but at that time that was the intelligence that was there that you know that's what we need to do um there was a drinking water plant that we made operational and we set up water dispensers all over the school but what was really surprising was that this school had no connection to the municipal drainage because of various issues the drainage had been blocked in some part by the government to make some buildings and the the contours were wrong so we actually had to create a septic tank and you can see the pictures here we had to dig out a huge septic tank and create it there so to take care of all the waste and the total cost was uh, it was not a global grant project it was just done by a club it was around 27000 us dollars so that's what it took to actually bring a proper set of toilets for the girls so what has we seen now um, the number of girls i just spoke to the principal and she says the number of girls have increased in two years to 1400 although there's a lot of again offline online classes are going on the attendance has also improved and she says almost by 15% we have an increase in the attendance dropouts have reduced according to her and she said that the girls are very comfortable with the new facilities we actually did a small function for them where we inaugurated the facilities and uh, the importance of washing hands many of the girls said that you know it was very helpful because during the covid 19 pandemic we talk about keeping hands clean but the best part of it is now that we have a real relationship and trust with these students with this college and we are constantly talking to them about menstrual hygiene the recent conversation has been that i'm actually going to set up a webinar for them on sustainable products like cloth pads and menstrual cups and imagine if we can convert 1400 girls what a great thing that would be so just to conclude um you know without proper toilets there is no point in even talking about menstrual hygiene because even to wash a cup you need some water right so there has to be a proper set of toilets everywhere and as rotarians we can really engage with the government we can engage with schools we can generate awareness and we can get help for schools raise funds and help them to improve the present conditions that are there the many uh, this problem is recognized by wash by un by many other governments but still we have a long way to go before we can achieve what we need thank you thank you anu and and again this is an initiative that um has benefited so many girls um when you think about a 1400 girls i mean that's that's a tremendous amount of attendees at a school uh but it's something that again becomes long lasting and you're right uh, using the the cups or the reusable pads is going to be uh critical to reducing the impact on the environment as well as providing an opportunity for them to continue with school and one of the things that um you know we we talked about is um and and this came up from it was suggested by Noel and this is just a thought for the a uh, menstrual health and hygiene is you're probably in a great position to do one of those large impact grants so they, he wants you to think about it <laughs> uh because he thinks you've got a winning initiative and now i'd like to turn a little bit to having a little bit of discussion and uh this is a panel discussion with Sharmila Ines and Vija and i have a few questions that i want to pose and i've seen some threads of some of these uh issues being raised i know the three of you are from different locations so when you talk if you could also share your location and your name of course uh but how uh, you know how have we gone to have a uh, open discussion about menstrual hygiene and girls staying in school how is that in your country how has that been uh brought about in i'm from an era where nobody ever talked about these issues and uh it's always been enlightening for me to listen to this discussion because it is something that even in the united states we did not talk about and yet um as i was telling a few people yesterday our governor signed the poverty period bill um for illinois so and that's to again uh, allow people to continue with school continue with their their jobs as well so thank you and um again if you can just share with us how is this 
um, you know, accepted in your country? And what type of issues have you run into? And how have you resolved them? So I'll start with Ines. Okay. Good morning, good evening. Uh, I'm Ines, I'm from Buenos Aires, Argentina. And when we began with this program, uh, there's an interesting thing I want to share with you. Our district governor, now is past DG, uh, said, okay, this is a great issue. In Buenos Aires, there is no talk about it. Yeah, there is a taboo. So Rotary must end with this poverty, but first of all, we must create awareness. And he said, I am in a position uh, that might create awareness, you know, faster than uh, other members of the clubs. So in his assembly, the annual assembly, um, he asked uh, Charlie to put the issue into the assembly and she gave us a wonderful, wonderful talk. And you know, the faces of the Rotarians, there were 800 Rotarians in that assembly. You cannot imagine the faces. What are we talking about? Is this governor term mad? Okay, what is he doing? <laughs> and that was great because from that moment, this conversation opened to me and well, I went to every club, to everybody in the district, and they knew what we are talking about. I mean, perhaps they weren't, they won't agree with that. They um, weren't comfortable with this uh, conversation uh, because it's something that is, you know, it's uncomfortable to talk about, to begin the conversation. But of course, he broke the silence. And from that moment to now, we have grown a lot in awareness and um, we are applying for a global grant. That my experience and I wanted to share it because it's so important that your governor is, um, is having this issue as um, one point, uh, number one, number two or number three in his agenda. You don't know how much it helps. Thank you, thank you, Ines, and Vija. Yeah. Do you wanna to respond um, to I'm Vidya, I'm from Rotary Club of Madras Temple City, which is uh, in Chennai, India, District 3232. Uh, India is a very paradoxical country in many ways. When, when girls attain, first of all, periods are a well-kept secret. Not much is talked about it like sex. Sex and periods are taboo topics here. We don't talk about it at all. And women and girls don't grow up know, knowing anything. Forget about women and girls, even men are totally uninitiated in these areas. And when it comes to the, the menstruation, it's even more crazier because the moment a girl, especially in parts of the country, in Southern and Eastern parts of the country, when the girl attains puberty, we have a big, huge event celebrating it. And the whole world gets to know about it. And even the poor of, of poor celebrate it. It's not just uh, the rich people, but even the poorest of poor, and they get gold and clothes and you know a whole lot of things when they attain puberty. They even borrow money, but they do it. And after that and before that, nothing is spoken about. So there are many myths and taboos there. And uh, when we go around holding advocacy workshops, we, re we recently went to a, a group of, say, police women or to schools. We find that, uh, A, the girls feel ashamed to have the periods for whatever reasons. And then when we tell them that it's a very important part of the biological cycle and you are actually capable of giving birth and you should know that you have that power, they feel good about it. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's how we are going about 
trying to make girls and women feel good about having the periods. And yes, uh, while we are advocating cups and uh, reusable pads, the other thing is, it's really not about what you use, but about women be, being comfortable in their own skin. And that's really what we are trying to do in all our educational campaigns. So that's been my experience so far. Thank you. Thank you. And Sharmila, if you want to say also where you're from and also, you know, what's what's the sentiment uh, that you're experiencing in your country? Yep. I'm Sharmila Nagarajan. I'm the current president of uh, Rotary Club of Tower Hamlets, which is District 1130 in London. I, my background, or oh, I'm originally from Malaysia, where I did my primary and secondary schooling. And we were taught about periods in school. We actually had someone who told us, I think when I was about 10 or 11 years old, um, about periods. I went to a convent school, so it wasn't an issue for us. It was openly spoken and we were educated and we knew about periods. Um, coming back to the UK, um, there are initiatives where the education secretary is setting out plans to make relationship education in primary and secondary schools and relationship and sex education in all secondary schools compulsory. So when that is done, they will be creating awareness about periods. And I think that will go the extra mile on understanding periods. That's all for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I have another question for the panelists. And is anyone talking about um, the disposable, the environmental issues, the amount of waste being generated in the country, in your communities? How, how is that issue being elevated? And Ines, we'll start with you. Okay. Uh, we are starting in, in my country, in Argentina, to, to speak about waste um, generated from the disposable pads. Uh, it is not um, something that it, it is easy to tell when you are poor. You know, when you are poor, you don't have money to buy your hygienic uh, pads or whatever. And so uh, put into the discussion the waste uh, that you will generate in 20 years or, or 50 years is not something that is important for them. So we have to educate those people. And in my country, there is a gap between um, poor and rich, or I, I mean, not so rich, but very, the, the gap is, is growing, yeah? So I, I might say that uh, girls, uh, well-educated, and the uh, 30 might see um, are uh, yeah, very awareness of uh, the waste and uh, um, they are turning to caps, absolutely. But we have a very, very big uh, problem in, in poverty and we have to work with Rotary in those communities which are uh, increasing each year. Thank you, thank you. And Vita? Yeah, uh, disposable is, uh, you know, disposal is really a big issue in, in the country. And uh, I should say that from, we were like 12% uh, of users of hygiene products in 2012. And today we are at 58%. And uh, there is a better penetration of some form of hygiene products of other, which is a welcome thing. But like offices, for example, large offices have incinerators. And I really have no idea. And some of the government-owned schools too, they do have uh, incinerators. So the focus is on uh, not getting it into the landfill as much as uh, trying to burn it. But one doesn't know if, if uh, these are uh, good quality incinerators or not, because it goes out on garment tenders and things like that. So it may not necessarily be the best uh, possible products. Now, uh, I have an interesting story here to narrate. I had been to a village uh, in north of India, which is a very, very patriarchal society and a very conservative society. And the women of this village have adapted beautifully to the menstrual cup. And it's, it's really amazing why, because of the disposal issue, because they had to walk. They did not have convenient disposal uh, in, in the houses. 
because they live in small uh, uh, you know houses independent houses in the village and probably do not have a bathroom attached or they have to use some common facility so these women if they had their periods the entire village would get to know about it so when we introduced the cups to them one of the ngos there introduced the cups to them they just took to it like fish to water you know and they are the biggest advocates for us today in the most unexpected quarter where we never thought they would adapt to the menstrual cup so this this is uh, the varied experience we have in this country uh, we have another problem we don't necessarily have all bathrooms public toilets with uh, with a trash can so in chennai actually we are trying to work with the corporation uh, to have what we call period friendly bathrooms where you can pick up sanitary pads if you are it, it's an emergency situation and also have a proper place to trash it because if you don't have a proper place to trash it it's going to end up in your sewage so this is uh, my feedback on disposed okay and sharmila thank you beja um in uk in public toilets and in schools there is a sanitary waste <coughs> disposable bin where you can drop your tampons and your sanitary waste in there uh, obviously in public toilets there it's each cubicle has this waste so you can throw it in there it's not encouraged obviously to flush it down the toilet because it's going to clog up and that's what we have in place in the uk but obviously at home it just goes under general waste um it's not segregated um i think it's about how you know how we sh we should um save the environment and think about the amount of waste that we throw at home that needs to be segregated as well that's what i i would think thank you thank you and smita i know you had a a response there was a question in the the um at the chat room there came up about disposal or incinerators and maybe you want to just add to that yeah so um the the viable way or the recommended way of dealing with sanitary waste is city level incineration where it is operated at temperatures about 800 to 1200 degree celsius because when you incinerate at that temperature the dioxins are you know not are, are minimal or they don't they're not released the micro incinerators which are being promoted everywhere they operate at 200 to 300 degree celsius which are like you know really tiny oven kind of a scenario where immediately the dioxins go into the air and dioxins do not have an uh, have a particular fragrance or a smell to identify you know uh, that these are dioxins they're just going into the system of you know little children passer by and uh, it's 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 a terrible scenario and i would strongly you know uh, request everyone uh, present here to not encourage any kind of micro incinerators they claim to have carbon filters this thing that thing however high tech they are at that you know uh, at that size and at that uh, if if it operated at 1200 degrees celsius it will be like a furnace you cannot have it in a toilet Thank you for the clarification. Um, and again, that's an important point because you you don't want to get rid of uh, waste, uh, you know, um, by doing that because it also pollutes the air and uh, again other things as well. So it, this has been a wonderful discussion, and I have to say, yes, um, Doctor, yes, we can't hear you. micro incinerators in india need electricity and we still don't have electricity all the time for this to work and where they have given micro incinerators the teachers have found that the girls have fallen sick so they have shut it down themselves so there are lots of problems not only the health but the fact that we need electricity the fact that it needs to be set up there are many things that are there we just have to go sustainable we have to not look at short term gains we have to look at long term gains we have to make every village self sufficient and making cloth pads the green dot program and if that can happen in india that can happen everywhere across the world and i learned a shocking incident i mean i think it's uh, known 
African, in Africa, girls actually start being sexually active earlier because the boyfriend will then pay for their pads. So if we all put in green dot or the equivalence of the green dot program, maybe the um, pads for girls, uh, whatever the programs are, we need to make that happen. We have to stop looking at short term uh, shortcuts. We have to look at long term gains and that will give dignity to the women and the young adolescent girl not to give up on, you know, her privacy just because she needs pads. Thank you. And, and Carolyn, is there anything, um, any other questions? I can't hear you. There was a question I was just going to ask Monique if she could um, ask a question because I would butcher the French. It's in French. And so if Mona could do that, read the question. Um. Okay, je crois que le problème du jean va se poser aussi avec ce nouveau produit lavable, surtout avec un mauvais lavage et stérilisation. Could you translate that for us? Uh, yes. So, um, the question is, is uh, I believe that the hygiene problem um, that is arising with the new washable products, especially with poor washing and sterilization. So I think the question is more, is there a risk um, with using these different hygiene products um, with being able to wash them if you don't have the ability to do so? Alors, il y a une question en français. Uh... Doctor, do you want to answer that? And then we'll, we'll move on. Thank you. So washing cloth pads is very simple. It requires a mug of water that is cold, doesn't even need hot water. And when you soak the pad, then the blood comes out, you squeeze it out, wash it and hang it out in the sun. If you hang it out in the sun, sun sterilizes it without any payment. And that is something that we can do because we wash all our clothes and hang it out in the sun. So I, I find it very difficult to understand what is special about the cloth pads. It looks like your normal cloth. That is all that it is. So there is no great difficulty. It's in our minds that we are worried that it has to be washed separately. I did tell you the vagina is an unsterile organ. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and this uh, program was really brought about by um, the collaboration between WASH uh, and the Menstrual Health and Hygiene Group. And I just want to remind everyone that there's opportunities with Rotary Action Groups to get involved and to be engaged and to have conversations like this around the world. I'm looking at this the screen and all the women that are from around the world and the impact that they're having. And I'd like to turn it over to Shamrila to have a few last words. Thank you, Pat. Um, all I can say is, I mean, we, we, as the action group, we come from all over the world. And our idea is to spread the word, break the silence, create the awareness, create the awareness on the products that's available. We are not pushing someone just to use the menstrual cup. It's whatever that one feels comfortable with. You have the right to choose the products that you want to use. Yes, we would encourage if someone is sexually active to use menstrual cup because it's cord saving, it's hygienic, it's easier to use. But obviously if someone is not comfortable, please go ahead and use a re reusable napkin. We are here to support you in any way we can to give you advice. We have do panel of directors and doctors in our group who will be able to give you the intimate details if you need. Um, and also we are here, we are a broad spectrum of uh, experience and we are happy to help. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, and a special thank you to all of the panelists today. Um, you are outstanding. And 
for me, it's always an education to listen to you because I learned so much, uh, so much I never knew. And, and also the opportunity that we have to really keep girls in school by providing them with the support they need. And again, and empowering women, because one of the things too is many teachers are women and they also have the needs when they're at school as well. So again, thank you to everyone. And we're gonna conclude with a video um, message from Shekhar, our president Shekhar. And if you wanna get in touch, you know how to get in touch with all of the, the Rotary Action Groups, the WASH and the Menstrual Health and Hygiene. And we thank you. And uh, we look forward to seeing many, because I saw in the chat box, many groups that are going to take up this initiative. So thank you all. And a special thank you to Brian Hall, the, the man behind the scenes that makes everything work. Thank you. Who's ready this morning? Thanks, Pat. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs>
Bye, Julia. Bye. 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 Excellent job, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.